first of all, hello everyone. Welcome to this nice, large crowd of people. We're still letting people into the room to the George Washington University and the Central Asia program, uh, which today is very, very pleased uh, to host uh, Professor Kenneth Yin of the City University of New York. Now, I'm, I'm your moderator, Professor Eric Schlussel, of, uh, Assistant Professor of History and International Affairs uh, here at GW. But our speaker today, who I'm very, very excited to have, uh, Professor Kenneth Yin, will be speaking on the topic of Dungan folk tales and legends and the folkloric narrative tradition of the Sino Muslims in Central Asia. I believe this will relate very closely to this wonderful new book that's been put out, which he'll be discussing today a massive translation of a collection of Central Asian Sino Muslim folk tales. Um, Professor Yin teaches modern languages, literatures, and linguistics at CUNY. His research interests obviously include, well, Dungan literature and culture, as well as the literatures and cultures of the Tungus peoples of North Asia, primarily the Udege and Nanai of the Russian Far East. He's the author not only of this book, but of a forthcoming book, Mystical Forest, the collected poems and short stories of the Dungan ethnographer Ali John. He has received lots of grants and awards from the ACLS, from the Mellon Foundation, from the NEH, uh, and the Davis Center at Harvard, and all sorts of places. And we're so, so pleased to have him here. Uh, the plan is, Professor Yin will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have our two wonderful discussants, uh, Professor Jimenez Tovar and Professor Beryoskin, who I'll introduce at that time, uh, to give some comments. And in the meantime, if the audience has questions, please start putting them in the chat, and we will uh, talk through them in the Q&A at the end of our session. And so without further ado, Professor Kenneth Yin, please take it away. Thank you so much um, for the introduction, Professor uh, Slusso. Yes, so um, I would like to begin by thanking the Central Asia Program, the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, um, and the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, with special thanks to Professor Marlene Laruelle and Jeanette Akmiradova. I would also like to express my deepest gratitude to our discussants, Professor Soledad Jimenez Tovar and Rostislav Biryoskin, as well as our moderator, Professor Eric Schlussel, for their participation in today's event. And okay. Uh, well, I could, um, I'll, I'll start to talk. So, um, what I want to do was start to um, talk uh, first about, uh, give a brief introduction to the Dungans of Central Asia before I jump in and actually talk about um, the book itself and some of the findings from the large study conducted um, by the, um, the editor and co-compilers of that edition. So the Dungans are uh, descendants of Sinophone Muslims or Hui who first crossed from Northwest China into Russian Central Asia after the suppression of the Dungan Revolt, which um, lasted from 1862 to 1877 under the Manchu-led Qing Dynasty. And this information comes from um, Svetlana Dyer, 1992. So most of the original Dungan settlers were poor, illiterate peasants or small urban craftsmen who had come from Gansu and Shanxi provinces. By tradition, the Dungans are Sunni Muslims of the Hanafi school, like most of their Central Asian neighbors. Uh, the Dungans have traditionally had large families, often with between six and eight children, and they enjoy a reputation as a hardworking and prosperous people. And again, this also um, is a reference from Dyer in her 1992 work. Um, so according to the latest census data available as of 2020, there are an estimated 150,000 Dungans, and this figure is the figure that I give in um, my book. So the Dungans today live primarily in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Eastern Uzbekistan. Right, yeah. So, um, Next, I would like to talk about uh, briefly about the editor and the two co-compilers of the classic Russian study, um, which I um, did a translation of. 
So the lead researcher is Boris Livovich Riften, who lived from 1932 to 2012. He uh, was a pioneer in the study of Chinese popular literature, folklore, and visual culture. And he was um, a doctor of philological sciences. Um, he is known to many by his Chinese um, pen name, uh, Li Fuqing, because he actually authored um, quite a few works in Chinese. Next, um, the, the first of the two co-compilers of the Russian um, study is Mahmoud Ahmedovich Hassanov, who lived from 1932 to 1977. He was a writer, literary scholar, and candidate of philological sciences. And he it, uh, was considered a leading expert in Dungan folklore, as well as an influential Soviet Dungan prose writer of the 1960s and the 1970s. And uh, the, the third um, collaborator on the Russian edition is Ilyas Ismailovich Yusupov, who lived from 1930 to 2005. He was a Dungan historian and candidate of historical sciences. And uh, he was a prolific researcher in Dungan history and philology who published more than 100 scholarly works during his lifetime. Okay. So I, I don't know if, if Jeanette, if you were able to receive the, um, the part. Uh, yes. <laughs> no? No. Oh, it didn't say, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure. Um, here it says it sent uh, four minutes ago, but I'll just continue. I think that's fine. Um, so uh, so okay. now I would like to talk and just introduce very briefly um, the, uh, the the Russian classic Russian study, Dungansky and Narodnyskaski i Pridanya, um, uh, Dungan Folk Tales and Legends. So this is a collection of 78 folk stories translated from Dungan um, into Russian by Boris Riftin, uh, Mahmoud Hasanov, and Ilyas Yusupov. And there were five stories that were actually translated from the um, original Chinese that had been published in Northwest China by the Hui as well. Um, because the term Dungan actually also has a broader sense, for example, when it's used by Russian speakers to include all of the Chinese speaking or Sinophone Muslims. But the uh, 73 of them were, are actually from the Dungans of Central Asia. So the, the edition was edited, as I mentioned, by Rifton, and it includes an extensive introduction and analysis by Rifton and Hasanov. And it was published in 1977 by Nauka Publishers in Moscow as part of its series called Tales and Myths of Eastern Peoples. So um, what, I, what I would like to talk about for the remainder of uh, my uh, part of the presentation is the in-depth structural and comparative analysis of Dungan folk narratives conducted by Rifton, Hasanov, and Yusupov. And of course, this is discussed in the introduction that I mentioned um, to both the Russian edition and also the English edition that um, just came out last year. So the 78 folk narratives um, serve as the, ba the basis for the, this, this study, and they appear in their entirety and are organized according to the Arn Thompson folktale classification system in both the Russian edition and the English language edition that just came out last year. So the findings indicate that Dungan folk stories are firmly rooted in Chinese storytelling traditions, but also exhibit substantial Middle Eastern, East Asian, and Central Asian influence. And uh, so the three uh, major uh, categories of tales, um, the titles of which you, you can't see right now without the PowerPoint slides, uh, but you can actually find them um, on the Amazon preview if you're interested in, in seeing them. 
uh, with, without access to the book, but the first grouping is um, the largest with 40 selections, and they are uh, the wonder tales and animal tales, as I've translated them. Um, the next grouping of the three is what I call a novelistic tales, folk anecdotes, and adventure stories. And here there are 27 selections. And finally, the third um, category, a uh, grouping of tales is um, legends, historical tales, and narratives. And here there are 11 sections, although many of the longer selections actually belong to this particular um, chapter part in the in the book. So um, I just like to briefly mention um, the eight general features of Dungan folk narratives, which um, have been identified by Rifton and his um, collaborators and are reported in the introduction. So the first is um, tale typology. So in terms of tale typology, Oh, I see, now we do have the slides. So I think we are slide 13 now. If you wanna to go to tale typology, so 13. Yeah, there we go. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, so in terms of the tale typology, um, um, the Dungan, categorization of the oral prose narratives is essentially into two major categories. One is gujir, which, which are typical folk tales, and the second is what's called fo, which um, can be compared with Beijing shuo shu, or, or storytelling to music. And the fo um, are literally our book stories, or those with a basis in the Chinese literary tradition, so the, the shorter and the longer sort of selections, yeah. Um, uh, next, Jeanette, yeah. okay. So the second uh, feature that I like to discuss and that, that Rifton um, and Hassan have discussed in their introduction is um, the origins of these Dungan folk narratives. So um, there are both Far Eastern and Near Eastern sources for the tales and it reflects the complex ethnogenetic and cultural ties of the Dungans. Um, there also is what might be called a down-to-earth nature of the fiction of the Dungan tale, and uh, especially a wonder tale, which links it to the folklore of Far Eastern peoples. So the action in Dungan tales, as for instance, in Chinese tales, takes place not in some distant and unknown realm, a land of fantasy, but rather all the uncommon occurrences happen with the hero nearby in places native and familiar to the storyteller. Uh, next, Jeanette. Okay. Um, the third feature is narrative time. So here we find um, a general lack of localization in time in the Dungan stories, which usually attribute the story action to an indefinite pastime. And uh, this is in contrast to the tales of a number of peoples of the Far East, for example, the Chinese and Koreans, who are generally inclined toward legend or tradition, which often specifically indicate the time of the action. Yes. Uh, next. Oh, next, Jeanette. Oh, we're on the next physical landscape number four. Yeah, so um, so the Duncan Tales have their own physical landscape. And um, it incl this includes, uh, for example, frightening and dangerous mountains, um, but never, interestingly enough, the frightful forests, which we so often find in European tales. It also includes the plain, which is often inferred rather than specifically described. Um, the sea, for example, the East China Sea where the Dragon King or Lun Wan lives, but interestingly, no lakes or rivers. And then also um, cities, 
and the, the, uh, the city is using an abstract quaint Chinese city rather than a specifically named one. Um, next, Jeanette. The next. Okay, so next, um, uh, just a few remarks about the common character types. So in these Dungan folk narratives, we find farmers, shepherds, petty traders, woodcutters, hunters, keepers of coaching inns, bandits, officials, and sovereigns, right? There are also, um, um, there's also mention of quite a few immortals. For example, a shen xian or simply xian, which is an immortal genius in Taoist mythology, um, as well as the holy hezir, hezir, whose depiction is typical in Near Eastern and Central Asian folklore. Um, and then, of course, we um, have many fantastical characters, including uh, the different monsters. And um, there are those linked variously with Far Eastern mythology, Central Asian folklore, the Near Eastern and Middle Eastern mythological sphere, Indo-Buddhist mythological religious beliefs, as well as Turkic folklore. And then finally, um, there um, is mention of, of uh, many times of familial relations exemplifying the idea of filial piety and punishment for undutiful children, which has uh, been mainstreamed under the influence of Confucianism. Okay. Uh, Next, number six. So um, next I would like to talk briefly about, um, uh, uh, make a few comments about individual motifs and plots in the Dungan folk narratives. So here we see um, depiction of the societal relations of old China in a uh, modified form. So for example, heroes encountering officials or emperors who seem closer to the common people than in the tales of the Chinese. Um, there is also frequent reference to two kingdoms and two sovereigns respectively. So this is possibly preserving memories of the periods of temporary fragmentation in China in the Middle Ages or memories of ancient tribal chiefs or clan leaders in the south of China, or the borrowing of plots from the folklore of neighboring non-Far Eastern peoples, presumably mainly Turkic peoples. And then we also have um, the uh, occasional appearance of the Ahun, which is a word of Persian origin. And the Ahun is a Muslim clergyman or mullah whose depiction is however, never found in Chinese folklore or Far Eastern folklore generally. And then we have um, folklore characters of neighboring peoples readily entering the world of the Dungan tale. For example, Lamas, Buddhist monks, and Taoist monks. Okay, um, next slide. So um, just a few comments about color symbolism. So red and green are often mentioned as bright colors, scaring away evil spirits and protect, protecting from adversity. White um, as the color of mourning. And this is both among the Dungans and among the Chinese. White is also associated with fantastical animals that typically help the hero or the protagonist. Black is mainly applied to negative characters and phenomena. Yellow um, often is pretends doom. And then um, blue and the closely related to green are associated with dark forces, such as a um, a, a green, uh, blue green whirlwind, for example, that sweeps away the, the heroine. And, uh, next slide. Yeah. So finally, I just want to uh, talk very briefly about number symbolism in these tales. So often mentioned are the numbers three, um, seven, which is uh, more peculiar to Far Eastern folklore, 72 and nine and its derivatives, especially 99. And then also 40 
um, is a number occupying a special place in Dangun folklore, apparently entering it from the Near Eastern cultural tradition. So you may recall the Near Eastern tale, Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, and um, it's the Dangun um, counterpart, uh, stories of 40 viziers. Okay, so uh, the next slide, as you will see, Jeanette, um, is simply the, the three references that I have used in today's presentation. So Svetlana Rimsky course called Dyer. Um, of course, the, the classic Russian study edited um, by Boris Rifton, and then my own um, volume, Dung Folk Tales and Legends, which came out last year. And um, if you have any, if you would like any further information about the Dungans or anything else that I'm doing, please feel free to email me um, after today's event at kyin at legcc.cuny.edu, or um, also, uh, you can also visit my professional website, which is at kjy.georgetown.domains. And um, thank you all so very much for your patience as we were um, um, putting up the slides and for, um, yes, thank you. All right, Professor Yin, thank you so much for the presentation. So glad to have you here. We'll now hear from our discussants. And in the meantime, if people have questions, please write them in the chat so we can bring them into the Q&A later on. Now, I think our first discussion uh, discussant is Professor Soledad Jimenez Tovar. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> okay, uh, so Professor Jimenez Tovar holds a PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Germany. Uh, she is a scholar of Russia and Central Asia. She's written many articles in English, Russian, and Spanish on the Dungans in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, and a pair of books, including one on Russian social thought concerning Latin America, and a volume on um, Central Asia. She currently works in the History Division of the Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas in Mexico City. So, Professor Jimenez Tovar, uh, so glad to have you here. Please, uh, your remarks. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I mean, I am absolutely delighted uh, to discuss uh, about uh, Ken, uh, Kenneth's uh, book. Uh, I'm just very, very happy when when uh, Peter Lang uh, contacted me, asking me to review the the, the project, I, I was just I mean that I I say well I, I couldn't uh, sorry it's it, I, it's my mind thinking Spanish I mean I couldn't put more honey on my review because it was not possible I mean as I I think this book is is absolutely important I mean it's it's very 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 uh, good to to have an English version because it's just a masterpiece of uh, of what has been written uh, in Russian language on on the on on the Sinophone in general, not only about the Dungan people. So I think um, uh, scholarship written in Russian language, both in the Soviet period and currently, not only by Russian people. I mean, this is why I, I emphasize the fact that it's in Russian language. So I am I am talking. I am thinking also about uh, Dungan uh, scholarship that usually is published in in Russian language. It's, it, it, it has a, a very a very different approach and a, a very very different kind of view that uh, the one that uh, uh, a person interested on sinology could find in in the literature written in English. I mean, as as somebody who has also a formation in Chinese studies and well, Professor Meyer is here. I mean, he he was. He was one of my heroes since, since I was uh, doing my my uh, master studies. So it's it's I mean it's a wonderful uh, scholarship, but it's very different to the one in Russian. So I think it's very important the the place that Kenneth In is uh, playing here uh, in uh, building this bridge between two different scholarships, and it's opening uh, the the discussion for those who uh, unfortunately cannot read the original in Russian. So besides that, I think, uh, and for the, for the discussion, I think I will 
I will make a very, very provocative question to Kenneth. I mean, we, we, when we met the first time, we just spent the whole the whole evening, actually, like three, four hours talking about Dungans and uh, how how difficult it is to to do research on, on, on such an interesting people. And the question I, I want to start the discussion with is, OK, I'm not denying the Chinese side of Dungan culture, but you have just mentioned all the different uh, philological influences that Dungan people have. So why to keep Dungans in Chinese studies? And why not uh, acknowledging the complexity of, of the, con the cultural configuration of Dungan people? especially since they have been in, in the move between uh, China and Central Asia and, and all this, all this uh, interaction and in exchanges, uh, cultural exchanges and so on. And also a second question is, what about the, the, the Russian slight Soviet Side of their own uh, culture. I mean, they arrived in the Russian Empire in the, in the in the imperial times, and they also were very very good citizens of uh, Soviet uh, Union. And well, currently they also, I mean, they, they live in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and they don't they not only speak a uh, Dungan language, this northern uh, Topolex, but they also speak Russian, and they also have all these long words from Turkic languages in, in especially Kazakh, Kyrgyz and Uzbek, depending the, the village actually is the, the, the composition of this Turkic part. So why to keep them in the, in the Chinese studies? I think these two questions are, are, are a good starting point for me and well, I'll let uh, Kenneth to answer. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for your um comments, Professor um, uh, Jimenez Tovar. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I, I'm so pleased that you did mention the, you know, the importance of making this uh, research that's, um, you know, done by the, the, the Soviet and the Russian scholars available to the larger uh, um, community. I mean, that, that was an important part of why I undertook this um, uh, large project, which ended up for me, taking, um, I, actually I started in 2005, so until the book was published in 2021, but on and off, you know, at, at times. But, you know, in addition to just the sheer enjoyment of the tales themselves and just how interesting and unusual that I found them, that was a really important part is to make this scholarship also available to the wider sort of English speaking community. So I really appreciate that you mentioned that. Um, in terms of your two questions, um, yeah, I, I think it is so very important um, in this sort of um, for Sinophone scholars, this example of, um, you know, um, of the Dungans, because it is so, un the case is so unusual that they, um, they actually have a Sinitic language, which is actually um, a, um, the Zhongyuan or Central Plains dialect of, of Mandarin. Right, which is spoken in uh, Gansu and Shanxi, where the ancestors of these Duncans come from in China. Um, uh, but they rejected the use of Chinese characters from the outset when um, they initially uh, migrated to Russian Central Asia in the, in the very harsh winter of 1877, 1878. So for many years, there was not um, really a, a any written form, but only the transmission of, for example, the the oral tales in the collection until the the establishment of Soviet power, right in um in in the twenties, and then we we see um, there was experimentation with actually two different Latin alphabets, which were eventually discarded in favor of a Cyrillic alphabet, which was officially adopted um, between 1953 and 1955. And that is in fact, the alphabet that is still in use to this day. So it does, it, it does challenge, you know, it is a very uh, exceptional and interesting case, right, for Sinophone scholars. Um, but, but also, you know, um, also for the study of um, ethnicity, 
in general as well in, in the former Soviet Union, of course, because there, were, there was um, the experimentation or the attempt to integrate in some, to, to, you know, to, to some degree, um, all of these uh, different um, eth ethnicities and, and cultures, you know, and, and, um, and Central Asia, of course, was no exception to that. So it's part of that. It's interesting because it's really part of both of those conversations, of course, you know, the Sinology in the one hand, but also, you know, the um, Russian and the Soviet sort of examination of the um, issues of ethnicity as well and literature, establishment of literature as well. So, um, Soviet literature is written, written literature for the Dungans and, and many others, uh, ethnicities, of course, in the Soviet Union who also did not have standardized written form until the Soviet period. Yeah. So I hope that answers the, your questions in some way. Yeah, I mean, the, yes, of course, this is a conversation rather yeah. than, than a, it's not an examination, right? So oh, exactly. I mean, I'm just, I mean, I know you're aware of all these discussions. I'm just trying to share that with the, the audience. I mean, of course, there are a lot of Dunga scholars here that I would love to hear. What do they think about this? Um, because, I mean, we are working for them. I mean, but it is thanks to them that we can do our work here, right? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and uh, I, I I also, I mean, it's because this, this uh, the two main groups, you, you forgot to mention the, the, the ones in, in Xinjiang, in the Ili River uh, region, but uh, well, they, they, they they arrived in, uh, to Ili since 18th century from Gansu. So they're like, like the, the top legs are still Shanxi and Gansu, mm -hmm. but they come from a, from, from a part of China that are, are actually part of a corridor, the, the corridor of Gansu oh, that uh, are also, uh, that is a, a key part in the, in the different Silk Roads or so-called Silk Roads. This, this uh, interaction and this these routes trade routes through which uh, everything passed by so why not to to think more about us like dungans as something that are i mean like like a, a cultural phenomenon that is very central asian that it's very interaction of many cultures and why not? I mean, why why not to start to stop thinking of China as the origin of everything? I mean, it is the origin of many things, but uh, but it's not the only origin. That's 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 the the, the point I want to make here. And I think mm. I think that uh, I mean I am an anthropologist, and I, I am not uh, so well trained in all these philological analysis. But uh, what, I have, what I have seen once uh, when, when I did my field work was exactly this very complex interaction that, uh, that cannot be understood, but through this idea of a mixture of a harmony, but not harmony in a Confucian way, but uh, I mean, harmony in its own way, in a, in a more, more in a Silk Road uh, way. So I think I, I think this 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 is the 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 kind of questions that uh, we should do in order to uh, to include Dungans in broader discussions because they, they are just yeah. I mean they are just so fascinating to me I mean I, I'm, I'm anthropologist so I, I'm just I just fell in love with with Dungans in terms of this complexity uh, and uh, well that was the reason why I I asked you this this question. So we're we're starting to get a big stack of audience questions. I want to be sure we hear from Dr. Beryoskin and then get a couple audience questions in before our hour is up. So uh, Dr. Rostislav Beryoskin uh, holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and a candidate of sciences degree from St. Petersburg State University. He's very well published in the field of uh, folklore and storytelling in China, particularly uh, in the genre of precious scrolls or Bao Zhen. It has a whole book on the various faces of Mu Lian. Uh, he's also worked on Russo-Chinese cultural exchange in the 17th and 18th centuries, and he's currently an associate research fellow at the National Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies at Fudan University in Shanghai. So, Professor Beryoskin, we'd welcome your remarks as second discussant. Uh, hello again. 
and uh, I'm indeed very glad uh, to be uh, here today, so online. Hope you can hear me well. Uh, it's indeed a great honor for me uh, to be uh, at this meeting. And uh, uh, the few remarks that uh, I would like to make um, is uh, also about the uh, main editor of the book, uh, Boris Lvovich Riftin, who was an outstanding scholar uh, of uh, Chinese uh, folklore and vernacular literature and also all kinds of uh, uh, Chinese literature. Uh, well, so uh, how did his encounter with uh, the Dungans uh, happen? This is also a very interesting story. Maybe not everybody here knows, uh, just briefly uh, talking about uh, this. So he was uh, at the uh, uh, he was a student of Chinese language uh, at St. Petersburg University, and uh, that's also university where I studied, and uh, I am from St. Petersburg. Uh, so uh, at that time, uh, China was pretty much isolated. Uh, that was beginning of uh, the 60s, even end of the 50s. Well. It was impossible uh, for Soviet students to go uh, for exchange in China, like uh, we, we uh, did uh, in, in uh, this modern period. And uh, the teaching of uh, spoken Chinese uh, was St. Petersburg University, then it was Leningrad University. It was not uh, satisfactory enough. Uh, so, uh, what uh, uh, Jan Boris Riftin decided to do in order to master spoken language was to go to uh, one of uh, the collective farms uh, where Dungans lived uh, in, in Kyrgyzia at the time. And uh, he uh, basically did the um, research of uh, the anthropologists and uh, folklorists. So he worked uh, as uh, the assistant of uh, the uh, mason, this, the, the bricklayer there. But uh, he, at the same time, he collected and studied uh, Dungan uh, folklore. Uh, so I think this is a very, very funny story because uh, later in, in his late years, uh, Riftin was uh, nominated the Academician of Russian Academy of Sciences. That's a very uh, high status in Russian academia, as you can imagine. And there are only few sinologists uh, who uh, received this rank of um, academicians. Uh, but at that time he was uh, he was very young and uh, uh, he mainly uh, worked on uh, the proverbs of uh, the, the Dungans. So uh, later he published a lot, uh, and this book uh, may be uh, said as a result of of uh, uh, his effort to collect and to present uh, this. Um, uh, uh, cultural uh, legacy of uh, Dungans. So the original Russian book is here. You can see it. And uh, it's for my personal uh, experience. I was the reader of this book since the age of nine or even eight. I don't remember exactly. But uh, this book was bought to me when I was. Uh, <laughs> still very small. And uh, that was my actually first encounter with uh, the culture of Dungans. I, of course, I, I did not know who were they at uh, that time. 
Uh, but I learned a lot from the book. I, I liked it very much. Uh, though uh, actually this is not the adapted version. That's, uh, these are not tales for, uh, for kids. Uh, and uh, well, uh, later it happened so that uh, I, I became especially interested in Chinese oral literature and also the connections between oral and written traditions in China. And this book indeed helps a lot. Uh, at this point, because as already mentioned, uh, Dungans, they mainly use oral version of these tales, but some of them, uh, include many of them included in, in uh, this book, they are indeed derivatives, obviously derivatives of the written versions or related to them in many different ways. And it's amazing that there you can find uh, the stories of uh, famous Chinese dramas that uh, have been known since the Yuan period. So the famous uh, stories of uh, Judge Bao and also, well, such uh, famous uh, plots as uh, killing the dog to persuade the wife and Chen Shimei's wife. So uh, uh, scholars who are doing Chinese literature, they are all very uh, familiar. And uh, this presents uh, just a very, very interesting aspect of uh, this um, transmission and the use of uh, Chinese vernacular literature that uh, Professor Boris Rifkin was uh, so much interested in. Uh, this is one point. And another point is about these international connections of, uh, of uh, Dungan culture. So it was already discussed at certain lengths, but I would like to mention that uh, this is not just about uh, meeting of uh, basically Chinese and Central Asian uh, culture, mainly these um, Turkic peoples um, of Central Asia, but there you can also find many interesting connections with uh, the Mongolian, even Tibetan uh, narratives. And this is mentioned, this is explained in uh, this wonderful analysis, mainly done by, by uh, Rifting, but also with the help of his uh, co-authors. And uh, uh, I certainly would recommend this book for, for everybody who is interested, not at um, specifically in uh, Dungans and their uh, culture, uh, but also for the purpose of uh, this uh, study of comparative uh, folkloristic and so on. So this is pretty much all uh, well, on my side. I can, of course, talk a lot about this. Well, I need to mention that this year uh, we have anniversary of Professor Riftin though uh, he, uh, he departed 10 years ago, but he would be 90 years uh, old uh, now. And uh, in Moscow, they, they just published the collection of his selected papers and uh, articles. That's also a big achievement because Riften, he had very interesting life and working experience. And he published many of his works in Chinese and there were no original Russian versions published. So this includes translation of many of his uh, Chinese articles that now will be uh, available for uh, the Russian reader. And the book by Professor Kenneth Yin makes uh, the translation of Tungan Tales available for the English language readers. Uh, there was already a translation into Chinese. Uh, so it's known in China. And the last que the question that I would like to ask uh, Professor Yin is about the modern fate of this uh, Dungan uh, folklore uh, tradition. Uh, so does this storytelling still exist? in uh, some places where the Dunkans live. Uh, because, well, if talking about the Russian 
uh, folklore <laughs> traditions, they are nowadays almost extinct. I think it's a big shame. It's a pity, but uh, that's reality. So what about uh, the Dungan uh, people? So if we go uh, there nowadays, can we still find some new, maybe new tales or some old narratives? Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Brioske. Um, I really appreciate the, your um, very sort of personal introduction to Rifton and the importance of these um, tales sort of in, in launching his, you know, Professor Rifton's very long and just, um, you know, um, prolific uh, career in, in, as a sinologist. Um, I also appreciate the contact, uh, the 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 um, comment about the the importance of these international connections. You mentioned, for example, Tibetan T Mongolian. Uh, I I tried to mention a few other in my very short talk at the front, but I, I didn't. And, and uh, in my comments, to, um, uh, though, uh, um, I I was talking a lot about the um, you know the Chinese side, the Sinology, and also the Russian or the Soviet side. But that is in no way um to imply that the the other that there aren't other influences and very important influences as somebody already mentioned in the chat about how the dungans in fact share a lot more with the central asians now than they would than they would perhaps with the chinese and i think professor jimenez tamar also mentioned the same right so but again all of these details are actually in the introduction um, to either the Russian edition or the, the English edition. So I hope you will have a chance to look at that. In terms of the moral fate of the Dungan folk tradition, um, they still seem to be alive um, in the uh, modern Dungan literature that I have seen, the recurring motifs, for example, um, plots, you know, elements of the plots and whatnot. So it, um, it's it's interesting that it is a um, it is an important part I uh, I think of um, of Dungan culture and understanding who the Dungans are, you know, in addition to all the other interesting sort of um, cross cultural types of connections that we were making um, today. So I really appreciate the, all the comments, Professor Bidioskin. I guess we should open it up now to the. The yes, um, thank you again so much to our discussions and to Professor Ian. We have, we have quite the audience today. It's very large and very expert. So we have a number of questions. I've picked out, I think we can get through two, maybe three. Let's see how it goes. But I'll point out that there is a discount code for 30% off in the chat if uh, anyone in the audience wants to use that to buy this book at a discount. So uh, one question that I also shared comes from Professor Dr. Ingeborg Baldauf of the Humboldt University in Berlin. Now, this is a good academic question. Uh, she asks, are there any scholarly insights by the original author of this book, which you've translated, with which you would not agree based on your own research in folk literature? That is, you've translated this book. Where do you differ from the analysis or the conclusions of the original author? And you're muted. Yes, um, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, I am not um, uh, academically, I should say academically trained as a folklorist per se. Um, so my interest in the project was more an interest in um, Dungan culture, Dungan literature, I should I should sort of say. And um, this is the, the first um, book project of um of a few that um well, another book is coming out and i have two other projects i'm working on so uh that being said um it, it's it's more difficult for me to sort of entertain that particular question um uh so um i would actually i would need to 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 um think about that um I don't know if, if, if either of the discussants would have any thing to say about that, but um, yeah, so, but, but my training, my, my uh, 
primary training. Uh, my, my, my my training is in um, is in actually linguistics in terms of my actual academic training, and then I became interested in the Dungan culture and Dungan literature in that in that way. Um, but perhaps I will find something as I continue my uh, my work with with Dungan literature with my other projects coming out. So I will have to follow up with the with the professor on that. <laughs> But thank you. That's a wonderful question. All right. Um, so we have another question from Professor uh, Maha Yun of Frostburg State University, another sort of global expert in Hui studies. And he asked a number of questions, but I'll pick this one out. What about Sufi influences in this folklore? Do your stories mention the Jahriya, for example, or other uh, Sufi orders? Um, not, no, they actually do not um no um i mean the i think i mentioned in uh the uh a, a very sort of very occasional appearance of the ahun who is the 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 mullah or the um the um the 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 the, the muslim clergyman but in general and and Rifton actually mentions this in the introduction as well um, the references, um, the Islamic references tend to be fewer than you might find, let's say, in the comparable tales of the Hui in China, the, the Sinophone Muslims in China. And one of the reasons that is put forth for this is perhaps that the, um, the Chinese-ness or the, the, the sort of the, the Chinese traditions of the of the Dangans in Central Asia, make them sort of um, set them apart more from their Central Asian neighbors, right? Maybe Turkic neighbors, um, more so than would perhaps the the Islamic sort of elements. So, um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Fatima Moldasheva from California asks about features of Turkic culture. What Particular features of Turkic culture might you find in the mythological types in Dungan folktales? For example, the Aydahar or Kazakh dragon or Ejderha, I guess, or other Turkic monsters. You've spoken a lot about sort of the East Asian element, the Middle Eastern element, but what about distinctly, specifically Central Asian Turkic elements? Right. So um, one that I do remember um, in terms of uh, characters that link the Dungan folklore with the Turkic would be the Tuzi, it's translated as T-U-Z-I. And this is um, a bald head or a mangy person. I translate it as the mangy one in some of the tales. It's a recurring character, but it's interesting. And this is from this word, uh, Tuz in the Dungan, is from the old Turkic word Taz, T-A-Z. Mm -hmm. And it's a cunning, who is a cunning trickster or a lucky cheat. And you will not usually find this in um, Chinese or other Far Eastern folklore. So that's one, um, just one of the examples that I could recall offhand. Yeah. Yeah, there's great in Gunnar Yaring's work on Eastern Turkestani folklore, the scald head, as he translates Taz, ah. appears constantly. So you can always, his stuff is in English translation. You can definitely, definitely check it out. Uh, by the way, folks, I recommend that folks also look to the chat. There are other experts sharing their own work on identity and such. This is such a great group we have. But I'll ask a question from a participant uh, who asks, if one knows nothing about Dungan people, could you recommend a book for the general public to begin learning about the Dungans? Um, I, uh, not to not to self promote necessarily, <laughs> but um, if you enjoy colorful, vibrant sort of just um, you know just wonderful, fascinating tales, um, um, you know either the the Russian edition of the Dungan Folk Tales Legend or my English language edition. Um, you know, and together, of course, with the with the scholarly introduction at the front, um, there are also um, many uh, works in English that have been put out by Svetlana Rimsky Korsakov Dyer, and she was my one of the references in my talk 
um, she's actually one of the few um, uh, English speakers who's who's actually written a, a quite a, a number of works on the Dungans. It's, and several of them are monographs, and they're um, shorter. One of her larger works was actually um, came out with Peter Lang in 1991 about um, Yasser Shivaza, the life and works of a Soviet Dungan poet. And that's an extremely also interesting volume um, because it, she actually presents the poetry in Dungan and, and tries to render them in the Chinese characters. And then of course also discusses them in English and has um, English uh, types of translations for them as well. So she's a, a very important name as well. But I think if any of these works would be a wonderful introduction in English anyway. I also brought a very, a very uh, small booklet uh, full ah. of pictures, the anthropologist as a mushroom, and then I, I, I tell, but I mean, it's more about Sanchi Dungans, because I mean, usually Dungans are taken as a whole, but they're very, very different among themselves as well. So my research is among is about Shanxi Dungans and what Svetlana has written. I mean, she differentiates, but other scholars usually take Gansu Dungans as if they were like the, the, the whole community. So I, I'll put the link here in the in the chat in case you want to, to have a look to my booklet. Oh yes. Oh right, exactly. I, yeah, that is also a wonderful book. And and um, you know, from your own personal experience being over there and uh wonderful photos as well. I really enjoyed this. That's also a wonderful book, of course. Yeah. So oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Professor Jimenez Tovar, for sharing that. I hadn't seen it. Um, so we are, it is unfortunately 12.02 p.m. here in Washington, D.C. Now, I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes, but we are, we're hitting the end of our period of time. So I'll happy to say thank you so much to Professor Yin, Professor Jimenez Tovar, Dr. Brioskin for being here for this discussion. I, I'm sorry we only have this short period of time to conduct it, but what a groundbreaking piece of work. Uh, what a wonderful year for Dungan studies, for the studies of Sino-Muslims globally. Uh, I'm very, very happy to have you here and very happy to see what this book is right. celebrating here and globally. All right, so thank you very much to our audience for wonderful questions. Um, Professor Yin, if people need to get in contact with you, they can find you at CUNY, correct? Yes, right. I, I, my, my email is it was it, at the end of the slide, so if they, it will be posted, of course, again on the um, George Washington University YouTube channel. And but it, it, yeah, yeah uh, uh, kyin at legcc.cuny.edu, or if you just put me, my name in with cuny, you'll find me, or, or my website as well. Yeah. Oh, I just okay. In the chat box. Well, that's a George. That's a Georgetown address. Janet, I oh, think. Uh, oh, right. That's where. Uh, that's the I, one that we had in our system. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me oh, right. That's the one I was using with you. Uh, I could put yeah. the other one. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the only one that I have. Okay. At L A G C C C N Y. Yeah, this is the more general one that I use, would be the. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I check that one more often in the school. <laughs> All right. In that case, once again, there's a discount code in the chat. And thank you so much to our speaker and our discussants and to a wonderful, wonderful audience uh, for being here for this event. Uh, I, I think we'll call it there. And hopefully we'll be in touch in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.